Hello everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we have Clayton Thomas Mueller of the uh, Matthias Collin Cree Nation. Uh, he's an indigenous environmental activist. Uh, we met him in Vancouver in 2010. He joined our Sochi Olympic protest. Um, but all over the world he's known for his opposition to the Keystone Pipeline. Uh, and you could say he's uh, one of the main guys who threw a wrench into the planning. Uh, he's also uh, one of the biggest uh, opposers of the Alberta tar sands, uh, which of course is a huge indigenous environmental issue. The people who are suffering from it are largely indigenous people, and uh, you know it's largely an, it's indigenous environment that's being destroyed. Uh, uh, Clayton campaigns against the multinational oil companies. Uh, he was recently on Al Jazeera TV talking about his Keystone opposition. Uh, his work's taken him to five continents across the world. Uh, he's based out of Ottawa, Canada. And uh, he's involved in many initiatives to support the building of an inclusive movement for energy and climate justice. Uh, he serves on the board for, global just, for the Global Justice Ecology Project and the Canadian-based Raven Trust. Uh, he's recognized by Utna Magazine, is that right? You know, I never really knew how they <laughs> uh, in a magazine as one of the top 30 under 30 activists in the United States and as a climate hero in two, as a climate hero 2009 by Yes Magazine. He's the Tar Sands campaign director for the Indigenous Environmental Network. Uh, is there anything? I try to do his uh, impressive uh, resume justice, but, you know, That's good. go ahead. Whatever you have to add. If I didn't, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Um, first and foremost, I, I just want to say what a privilege uh, it is to uh, be able to see the, the incredible people that are lifting up these young leaders that I met uh, a couple of years ago uh, in Vancouver. And uh, just to say how inspiring it is when you can see a um, community that is working in a strong intergenerational framework fighting for justice. So I'm very humbled to be um, invited here into the community to, to share a couple thoughts with you all and I just wanted to recognize um, you know uh, uh, what I feel is, is a very inspiring movement for justice uh, represented by the No Sochi campaign. Um, I, I guess a little, a little more specifics about myself I'm, uh, I'm part of the indigenous nation uh, in northern Canada known as the Cree Nation I come from an Indian reserve in northern Manitoba on the border of Saskatchewan and Manitoba at about the 56th parallel, uh, known as Pugatawagan Cree Nation. And uh, my community is comprised of uh, fisher people and, and hunters. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just really happy to be here. I have uh, uh, two sons and, and, a, and a wife who I... Uh, I live with in Ottawa, the capital city of Canada. That's where my office is based out of. But the organization that I work for, the Indigenous Environmental Network, is um, based in Minnesota, uh, northern Minnesota, at the headwaters of the Mississippi River. And uh, we have offices throughout the continent, North America, or what we refer to as Turtle Island, from Alaska all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And, our indigenous environmental network is comprised of about 250 indigenous communities and our mission is to fight to protect the sacredness of Mother Earth from toxic contamination and corporate exploitation. And we're recognized here in the U.S. as an environmental and economic justice organization and we have a variety of campaigns that support community-driven um, objectives or campaigns. And so uh, a lot of our work is really focused on supporting local organizing and stopping in many instances in many different places the same companies who are threatening uh, our communities uh, all over uh, Turtle Island and really all over the planet uh, because of the nature of the transnational corporations that we get into it with. So. Uh, Clayton will be uh, Clayton will be presenting tomorrow at the Soros Foundation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he'll be talking about nonviolent movement and direct action. 
So he'll be giving us a little bit of a preview of his uh, tomorrow's presentation, and I hope uh, as circadian activists we can learn a little bit something uh, from that. Um, uh, there's obviously an importance uh, with understanding the indigenous North Americans' plight because we obviously have a lot of parallels in history. Uh, we can arguably say that indigenous North Americans face genocide, uh, obvious uh, forced uh, migration and deportation, uh, forced assimilation and acculturation. Uh, there, there's a, uh, we both share the issue that we're trying to maintain a language uh, but we don't have uh, the resources available and that uh, our respective governments, the North American governments, and in our case the Russian governments are largely ignoring our indigenous issues. Um, we also share, uh, we also have in common that our environments are being destroyed. Obviously indigenous environment is being destroyed in tar sands and of course uh, with this Keystone Pipeline project and uh, of course indigenous people suffer for that. Uh, in Sochi, it's the same gas problem as dumping toxic drilling fluid in a circassian territory that was once untouched. Um, and uh, indigenous North Americans have been active a lot longer than circassian people have been in their activism. So I'm hoping that we can take uh, something away from you guys and we can learn a little bit uh, from you guys while offering our own support too. Uh, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, uh, Vancouver 2010 and the indigenous issue. Uh, Circassians are coming up in 2014 uh, with the Sochi Olympics, which are going to be held on, uh, you know, the land of the Circassian genocide. It's where 60 to 70 percent of our nation was killed, and the remaining 90 percent were deported. And obviously, uh, to most of us, this is a huge insult. Um, and, you know, the case is similar in Vancouver. Uh, the games aren't doing enough to recognize uh, the plight of the indigenous North Americans, obviously the tragic history. So we want to talk a little bit about that. Uh, in, uh, about the Vancouver 2010 games, I wanted to ask, do you think indigenous North Americans benefited from these games? Because we know that some First Nations have participated in the games, and the issue is the same for Circassians because there's a small group that's pushing for uh, participation in this game, hoping to get a cultural highlight. Uh, but then there's another group that uh, doubts that uh, we'll ever get that or that it'll be satisfactory or we can be much effective utilizing the games as a political platform. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was your experience in 2010? Well, this is a really important question, you know. Um, because of the fact that what it addresses, I think, is, is, is the, the strategy, if you will, to minimize the powerful social movement uh, framework that was put together and the strategy that that framework initiated to elevate the concerns of local communities uh, affected by the 2010 Winter Olympics. Um, you know, the, the conquer and divide tactics of the International Olympic Committee working in collaboration with the Canadian government, with the government of British Columbia, the provincial entity, um, as well as the municipality of Vancouver and the four host First Nations. Um, you know, basically this whole process of um, providing an international platform, economic development opportunities, um, all of this was is essentially set up to try and uh, get buy-in from First Nations peoples who rightfully so are very upset um, that the Canadian government would divert, you know, in, 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 in hundreds of millions of dollars, public dollars, funds, into a sporting spectacle when our people, our communities, are experiencing the highest rates of uh, unemployment, of dropout from, you know, our schools, whether it's high school or uh, post-secondary, experiencing the highest negative health statistics in the country, uh, the highest uh, um, substance uh, addiction rates in the country, suicide rates, incarceration rates, uh, the list goes on and on. And so for the Canadian government to minimize its own uh, policy of ignoring 
the socioeconomic crisis that is playing out in Native communities and to lift up, you know, the city of Vancouver in essentially a sporting spectacle uh, when there's so much wrong uh, in the city of Vancouver in particular. Um, because just to give you a bit of idea about Vancouver in comparison to the rest of the country, Vancouver is a, is a, a very densely populated urban center. It's the second most populated urban center in North America next to Manhattan. A lot of people don't realize that. Um, and so space is very limited. What the Olympics uh, in the lead up to uh, the games in 2010 uh, provided in the way of opportunities for real estate developers, both domestic and international, uh, it provided them an opportunity to utilize the Olympics as a cloak uh, for a massive gentrification scheme. And in essence, what they did was disproportionately target communities in the downtown east side and in other regions in the city of Vancouver uh, and, and, and you know, basically started to buy up property. Now there's a housing crisis in Vancouver because of how densely populated it is. And the majority of available low-income housing is concentrated in this neighborhood that is internationally recognized for grave socioeconomic <coughs> uh, situations, the downtown east side. The demographics of the population that live in this neighborhood are predominantly indigenous peoples or First Nations peoples. Um, and there is a, 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 a phenomena of our people that you know, come from all across Canada that migrate to Vancouver because it's warm. You know, Canada's cold as heck. I mean, y'all get cold here too, but you know, where I'm from in Winnipeg, it's really cold, minus 60. So you'll find that a lot of folks, you know, they migrate to the coast, and that's why there's this huge homelessness situation there. And for those that aren't homeless, a lot of people depend on the low-income housing. Now, part of the Olympic machinery was the purchasing of a lot of the low-income housing and the development of high-priced condominiums and facilities to house Olympians while the games are going on. Um, and, uh, you know, this presented all kinds of problems in its own right. The other problem that the Olympics, uh, uh, you know, brought, I guess, to Native folks is agitating or exacerbating current land-based struggles that are happening in and around the Lower Mainland region, uh, which is the region that Vancouver is housed within. Um, because for the lead up, of course, you know, Olympians needed training facilities, uh, so ski resorts were expanded upon, uh, encroaching into sacred sites and traditional uh, land use sites of local tribal peoples uh, who relied on those territories for hunting uh, and fishing grounds um, and ceremonial needs or religious purposes, I guess, would be a way to frame it. And a lot of these areas were destroyed for the purposes of, you know, expanding ski hills so that the skiers could practice skiing before they went to Whistler for the actual games uh, in the area of Sun Peaks, um, which is inland from Vancouver. And also, there was a doubling or twinning, I guess you could say, of the highway from Vancouver to the small skiing village, an internationally renowned resort known as Whistler. Um, they doubled the highway, which required them to blast uh, 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 a sacred site of the local Squamish people, known as Eagle Bluff. And, um, you know, as a result of the blasting of Eagle Bluff, um, critical habitat for, you know, bald eagles and golden eagles uh, were destroyed. Uh, you know, animals held sacred in the culture of local tribal people. Um, and there was actually a local elder by the name of Harriet Nahani, who was a well-known activist in the area, a grandmother from one of the local nations, who stood up and, and, and in front of the heavy machinery that was trying to get in to destroy this area to expand the highway for Olympic traffic. Um, the judge, you know, ended up giving her, uh, you know, a six month or so sentence. Um, I don't know the exact date, but it was somewhere in the vicinity of, you know, three to six months. And this is an 80 year old grandmother who was quite simply standing up in an act of nonviolent, direct action 
to protect a sacred site for her people. And to make an example of this grandmother, they put her in prison. Now while she was in prison, she caught pneumonia and she actually died, um, you know, while incarcerated. And this is uh, an example of, of kind of the brutality of the policies um, that local communities adopt, you know, when they get engaged by this massive sporting spectacle. And I just kind of put this all out there real quick here because, you know, whether it was the displacement of predominantly, uh, you know, indigenous or First Nations uh, poor people in the downtown east side, or the destruction and desecration of sacred ceremonial areas, uh, or medicine harvesting areas, or critical hunting and fishing areas, the Olympics itself, as well as the entire uh, construction operation, had a very disproportionate impact on specifically indigenous peoples living in the region um, versus the rest of society. Um, so, I don't know if that... Yeah, actually, it's the same uh, with Circassians, too. Um, obviously, uh, you know, you, you're talking about how... Uh, how uh, there's Olympic construction going on on these sacred sites and these sites that are of public use to indigenous people. And uh, it's the same for Circassians. You know, on some of the uh, major sites, Sochi is actually uh, one of the major uh, port towns from which we were deported. And so, of course, we, we find that uh, incredibly offensive. Uh, what they'll be building, there will be ski resorts and, of course, uh, Winter Olympic uh, infrastructure, uh, and and the same is uh, same is true in Vancouver that while they spend these uh, millions of dollars on uh, on on hosting the Olympics, uh, the issues on the ground go ignored. So whereas they're spending billions in Sochi, they're not spending any money on repatriating Circassians back to the Caucasus or on economic stability that would ensure uh, betterment for Circassian uh, society at large. So I'd say that we share that in common. Um, you know, for us, uh, our biggest concern is uh, using the Olympics as a political platform. Now, do you think that Circassians, uh, and you would uh, have some experience, so we can draw the parallels between what happened with the indigenous North Americans. Do you think uh, Circassians should use the Sochi Olympics as a platform a political platform and rally around it in opposition to these games because of course a lot of uh, international attention will be surrounding these games or do you think that uh, do you think that participation in these games is something that would uh, bring some satisfactory change or betterment to our, you know in our indigenous situation well you know I, I, I think first and foremost um, you know, in, in looking at the, the, the Circassian struggle, um, I would say that the parallels are, are, are very obvious, very blatant. Um, you know, when we look at the, the compared history between the history of Native Americans or First Nations as we're, we're referred to uh, in Canada, um, and just the whole history of, of genocide and this whole kind of why don't you just get over it thing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Meanwhile, everybody in New York is driving around with never forget stickers. You know what I'm saying? You know, so give me a break. I'm not gonna get over it, right? Um, you know, what I would say is, it was very difficult and divisive in, in, in Vancouver. You know, we had this, this crew of, of the four local tribes that call Vancouver home. You know, the city of Vancouver is built on the sacred shell mounds um, of local tribes. And in Vancouver, underneath those streets and those buildings of all those glass towers in those canyons, when you walk through the streets, for those of you that have been there, underneath there are, are piles of shells that go down dozens of feet. And within those shells are the bones of the ancestors of the tribal people there. Those are the burial sites. Um, you know, and it, it's really interesting because a lot of people don't realize that the significance, the history um, that that particular area represents. Um, you know, so part of the, the propaganda machine creating division was the recognition by the IOC and by 
you know, Vancouver, and there was some interesting political dynamics too between IOC and 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 uh, you know the government of Canada, the government of British Columbia, you know, to really elevate the cultural uh, visibility of First Nations, the host nations, the culture piece, you know. In other words, why don't you get up and do some fancy dancing in your traditional regalia and then go away? Um, you know, a lot of people took offense to it, and it split. It divided families. You know, we have a lot of people who depend on, you know, dancing, on arts, on traditional dancing, you know, to make money. I mean, that's how they feed their children. So it was a really difficult situation because there were literally hundreds of First Nations flown in to Vancouver for the opening ceremonies. How many of you watched the opening ceremonies? Do you remember the, it's just this huge spectacle of uh, literally hundreds of representatives from the hundreds of different First Nations in Canada, um, you know, held by these four host First Nations. And our federal political advocacy organization in Canada, the Assembly of First Nations, um, led by the time by uh, Grand Chief uh, Phil Fontaine, uh, you know, had came out in support of the Olympics as well. Um, and so it became a very divisive issue because there was a lot of people, grassroots people, who, who said, you know, forget the money, you know, forget the economic opportunity. It's not worth sacrificing, um, you know, these beautiful sacred sites. You know, they expanded the, the, the electric rail from the airport to downtown Vancouver for the Olympics. They didn't do the environmental impact assessment, and they found all kinds of our native people in the region's ancestors while they dug those new, those new train lines. There were no cultural impact assessments. Um, there was no environmental impact assessments, no proper <laughs> consultation with local tribes, which in Canada is, constitutional, is a right that is constitutionally enshrined, the right to consultation. Um, it's law in Canada. There's Supreme Court precedents on this type of thing. And um, so a lot of the a lot of the local First Nations, you know, they decided to go for the money and participate. Uh, you know, they've got funding from the ILC, from the province, from the federal government to develop cultural pavilions, to develop cultural programming, uh, to participate in the opening ceremonies. Um, you know, and there was a substantial transfer of money to a very small and elite group of people who many of you sold out. Um, now that said, the hundreds of dancers that opened up the Olympics, personally, I understand where they're coming from. I empathize with them. Did I support them going and participating in that spectacle? No, I don't. But did I understand? the situation that they are faced with and why they did it? Yes, I do. Our people are the lowest of the lowest when it comes to the economic ladder in our country, in our own homelands, for the poorest of the poor. And so, you know, just like I don't support the fact that the development that I campaign against, the tar sands, is the biggest employer of indigenous peoples in our country. So it's not about the workers and it's not about, you know, the people that, that you know, danced at the spectacle. For me, it was much more about the corporate sponsors, the IOC themselves, and the governments that they're manipulating with their agenda, which, which essentially is a big real estate scam. And if you look at the history of the Olympics, it's the same thing in every instance, whether it's summer or winter Olympics. There is a massive operation that usually begins with a cleaning up of the streets by police entities. Um, you know, in Brazil right now, there is a war going on in Rio. Yeah. Okay? Where the cartels are shooting down helicopters, U.S. Apache helicopters. The police are not winning, okay? Because they're trying to clean up the bayous, the poor communities in Rio, for the Olympics. <coughs> and it's the same kind of spectacle in every Olympics as you go through history, okay? Militarization of the region. Vancouver, next to London, became the most highly monitored city on the planet through CCTV, closed circuit television networks. There is a camera on every single corner from every possible angle in the city of Vancouver that to this day remains 
after the Olympics, why didn't they take down this security apparatus that was put there in the event of terrorism? Okay, that was the justification for spending millions and millions of dollars on the CCTV network. You'd think that the policy would come to an end when the spectacle of the games left the city. It has not. And those cameras to this day are invading the privacy of, you know, civilians that are not terrorists, but that are now being recorded every single move that they make. Um, and the same thing about the investment in the policing. You know, the expansion of the police forces in Vancouver, the empowerment of those police forces with new technologies for crowd suppression, crowd control, um, so-called non-lethal technologies. Um, you know, all of this stuff that came in with the security budget of the Olympics remains to this day. And Vancouver to this day remains a highly, uh, 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 I wouldn't say go as far as to say militarized, because I know you all know what it means to live in a militarized zone and the implications of that kind of security culture. But I would say that it's a police state in Vancouver. And unfortunately, the butt end of that kind of uh, presence of police ends up falling disproportionately on indigenous peoples and not anybody else. Yeah, the same is the issue uh, with Circassians because uh, as these Olympics come, uh, to Sochi in 2014, uh, you know, Russia is uh, undoubtedly going to unleash, uh, uh, they're going to implement these uh, new technologies, and it's going to end up turning into a police state, inevitably. And uh, Russian policy and policing already shows that uh, the people of the Caucasus are targeted uh, disproportionately more than ethnic Russians are. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, as things clamp down in Sochi, you know, I also expect that human rights abuses are going to be rampant, and you know, not only rampant, but they're going to be targeted at specific ethnic groups. And I, of course, I imagine that Circassians, as people of the Caucasus, are going to be uh, involved in that. And uh, but besides uh, economic issues, uh, that aside, uh, there's also a cultural issue uh, because when these when these arguments are made about participating in the Olympics. People usually bring up uh, the idea that these Olympics will finally showcase our culture in a way that we find satisfactory, and uh, you know, this is uh, this is received with uh, mixed reactions in the Circassian community because we don't understand what it means for uh, for us to be uh, for us to be finally put on a pedestal, satisfactory. Does it mean that we need recognition of our genocide? Does it mean we only need dance and music? Uh, I mean, does this really touch hard at the issues that are significant to Circassians today? And uh, I mean, uh, what do you think? Uh, how did it work out uh, in Vancouver? Did you were you finally able to showcase uh, the things that uh, portrayed your culture significantly? Well, you know, I think that I think that. For me, culture does not, is not a separate thing from struggle, okay? Just like struggle is not separate from our culture. Our culture empowers us to continue our struggle, okay? Our spiritual connection to the sacredness of Mother Earth empowers us to continue uh, our struggle. Um, when we become overwhelmed, you know, by the forces that we are up against, most powerful corporations on the planet, a government that to this day continues a policy of extermination and extinguishment. You know, I, 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 I would say that it's our culture that, you know, enables us to have resiliency to continue to push through and, you know, to fight for rights for our children, a better quality of life. Um, I think that, you know, are we fighting, uh, uh, you know, for, a, for a, a, a commodification of our culture, uh, to make money from our culture, um, to see it monetized? Um, no, not at all, you know. Um, we're fighting to preserve that because it's, it is our connection, you know. It's who we are. Um, did that get expressed at the Olympics? No. Did anybody talk about 
the fact that, you know, in Canada there never was a war, you know, that we signed peace treaties with the British Crown, which transferred to the Canadian Crown uh, when Canada became a country, you know, only 200 or so years ago. Um, you know, to this day, when we talk about Indian treaties, you know, white people in Canada have treaties too, so do new immigrants. They have treaty rights. They're part of the treaty. Those treaties were between the original people of the land and the settlers, okay, on an agreement of how we could share the land, its wealth and resources in a respectful way. The Iroquois from north of here, you know, the Haudenosaunee, they have the wampum belts. And the two rows in the wampum belt represents a river with two paths in it. Okay? Those two rows represent two canoes, one for the white man and one for the red man. And although they're not together, they will forever go down that river in the same path. Okay? But these types of agreements, you know, the government has a policy to try and extinguish them, to evolve its federal or fiduciary responsibility and its trust relationship that it has that's defined by these treaties uh, which are constitutionally recognized, um, um, you know, to, to try and forget about them. And it has propaganda campaigns to try and make Canadians forget about them and try and make Canadians think that they don't have treaty rights and responsibilities too. And, you know, the reality of it is, is that wealth in Canada fundamentally is based on the oppression and suppression of indigenous rights and indigenous uh, access and control to our traditional lands. Now in Sochi, you know, will having people participate at the Olympics allow for the millions of Syracusans or Circassians uh, to return back, you know, to come back, to have rights? I don't know, you know. Um, but I would probably say probably not. It's more of a, of, a, of a way, I think, as a PR strategy, you know, to avoid conflict. Um, you know, I've been told that uh, your land is full of wealth, full of minerals, full of oil, you know, natural resources, and that's usually what it comes down to. And as I mentioned, the Olympic spectacle Sure, they say it's about world peace, about friendly competition between nations, but really, it's just a real estate operation. It's just a real estate operation for what the Occupy movement refers to as the 1% to get more properties and more urban centers, to develop them, and to make money. Yeah, well, circassian policy uh, since the 19th century has been genocidal. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, in 1864, uh, we we're coming to the end of our uh, genocide and forced deportation. But the policy that Russia has been, uh, has, uh, you know, Russia's policy towards Circassians uh, has been incredibly hostile. I mean, uh, our language rights are slowly being taken away, mm -hmm. whereas people are starting to uh, speak less of their native tongue and more of Russian. And obviously, uh, that ties into economical issues since people have to leave to uh, central Russia in order to be able to seek out jobs. Um, and even uh, and going even further into it, um, we, ha we haven't been able to properly assess ourselves as indigenous people. I mean, uh, in 19th century, uh, 18th century, indigenous people before, uh, uh, before uh, North American settlement were obviously a little more autonomous than they are today. And today they have little flex in, uh, uh, in their own issues. So they're being, in the same way that uh, indigenous North Americans are being deprived of their ability uh, and their right actually uh, for self-determination and to be able to, uh, uh, you know, we, under, we understand ourselves the best, you know what I mean? We know that what we have to get done, we know what we need in order uh, to preserve our identity, our cultural uniqueness. Uh, but it's obvious that both of our governments have policies that have been effectively genocidal. What we, what we consider today to be a continuous genocide. Mm -hmm. that 
our genocide didn't stop in 1864, and that Russia's policy today has continued to be genocidal. Now, the hope of Circassian activists is to use the Olympic Games as an international platform, because a spotlight will be there. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Is it, the is it the right opportunity? Because in 2014, people see this as uh, if an opportunity that if passes, will be, you know, some people have said we might as well bury ourselves at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't agree with that necessarily. Um, does the Olympic, you know, spectacle represent an opportunity to elevate, you know, the Sochi struggle, uh, you know, to, to elevate the issue of the Sochi genocide and the, and the, Syrac the Syracusan struggle? By all means, for sure it does. You know, our approach looking at the 2010 games uh, in Vancouver was really about, you know, the first platform that, that was developed in unity, kind of our unifying statement among social movements and indigenous groups in Canada was no Olympics on stolen native land. This was the platform, uh, you know, that really framed our campaign um, in the Olympic Convergence organized by the Olympic Resistance Committee. Now, um, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Uh, it's difficult when you organize. There's many different uh, perspectives. Sometimes the goals might be the same, but the paths to get to those goals may be adversarial. All right? There may be different um, priorities in terms of messaging. Um, and so there was a lot of challenges, you know, amongst the coalitions when they came together. There was fighting, straight up arguments, you know, uh, events that didn't happen because people couldn't get their things together. But what was pulled together was a very profound platform that provided a, a opportunity for voices that typically are not heard to be heard on an international scale. All right? And I'm sure you all observed that by the incredible leadership that was displayed by the young people that came representing your campaign to Vancouver. Now what I'll say though is for us as Indigenous Environmental Network, our specific uh, uh, outlook on the Olympics was to target the sponsors. Um, the Olympics was sponsored by the Royal Bank of Canada, which is the biggest financier of fossil fuel development in Canada. It was also uh, looking at, at targeting Canadian uh, CNR, Canadian National Rail, uh, which is a big player and a transporter of tar sands oil. Um, and also looking at Suncor Petro Canada, who was the official energy supplier of the Olympics, and also Canada's <coughs> biggest energy company. And so most of the companies that were sponsoring the Olympics at a high and visible level were companies that were profiteering off of the destruction and desecration and oppression of indigenous peoples, and off of the dispossession of those indigenous peoples from their homelands as to which they've lived for time immemorial. In Canada, over 50% of our native people no longer live in our communities. They live in urban centers, many of them in the poorest of the poor neighborhoods, many of them underemployed or unemployed. Um, the reason that many of them have left to the cities is not because they wanted to live the city life or to get a good job in the city, um, or even to get education in a Western education institution. It's because their homelands were devastated by massive mining operations, clear-cut forestry operations, or massive oil and gas development at an unprecedented scale, because Canada's economy is based on extractive industries. Um, our manufacturing sector in the last decade has lost hundreds of thousands of jobs because of the fact that our dollar is now determined by the price of oil. And we've effectively become a petrol state because of the fact that we have the second largest petroleum reserve on the planet, and you know the United States has an insatiable appetite for oil, and they're our largest trading partner. And so our goals with the Olympics was really to go in there and start targeting those specific companies that I outlined. Now that said, um, we have a specific protocol. We don't just drop into somebody's territory and do our thing. We're not Greenpeace, you know. We're interested in building effective social movement strategies 
that facilitate solidarity between social movements, that expand a political base of resistance, and that you know create enough pressure to impact our adversaries, or our enemies. Um, and so you know we went into the Olympics looking, uh, you know, we started months before the Olympics started trying to facilitate links with different crews that were part of the Olympic Resistance Network, but it was delayed because of the problems that I had mentioned. When you bring diverse movements together, there are certain challenges. That said, we were able to pull off incredible uh, mobilizations, uh, mass mobilizations. We did a variety of direct actions against different corporate sponsors, um, a lot of brand uh, subversion, you know, brand damage work on companies uh, highlighting their human rights record. Um, and it really, uh, you know, we came out of it feeling pretty good. And we came out of it with a really strong and united, um, you know, and diverse social movement in Canada, which prepared us in many ways for the next big challenge, which, you know, and you guys weren't there. <coughs> Tomorrow was pissed off, she said. Um, but, you know, it was the G20. You know, we had the G20 in Toronto, and I don't know if any of you watched the news, but it was a little crazy, you know, like for Canada anyway, you know, Canada's pretty chill. <laughs> Got crazy in Toronto, um, burning police cars and such. You know. I know that's normal in, in, in Europe and stuff, but for Canada, 20 burning police cars is pretty hardcore, unless it's a hockey game, and, you know, it's normal. Um, we have hockey rides all the time. Anyway. So... Um, you know, the point I guess that I'll, I'll just make, though, is that, you know, for us, you know, we really, it's one of the reasons, actually, why we reached out, you know, to, to, to our friends that were there from the No Sochi uh, Olympics campaign was because they were like, hey, we, you know, here's our issue, this is what we're doing, can y'all come out and support us? And so, of course, we went and supported, you know, because we all have uh, a, a similar goal. Um, in terms of trying to hold the, the, the scam of this sporting spectacle accountable. The fact that it's just really uh, 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 a real estate, uh, you know, theft uh, uh, operation. Um, and that really it doesn't do anything to advance any of the PR spins that they put out in terms of like standing for light and peace and justice and, you know, competition between nations and the spirit of giving and Santa Claus and all that good stuff. Um, you know, when in reality it represents the continuation of neoliberal policies um, that further uh, exploit natural resources and continue to suppress people uh, who depend on those resources for the way of life. Um, now, what I wanted to move on to was uh, what you'll be speaking about tomorrow, which is uh, nonviolent action. Uh, Circassians in like the past 10 years have uh, ramped up their social activism. I mean, uh, last year for the first time ever, Jordan uh, took part of uh, the uh, May 21 uh, protests. They held their own, uh, and this was in the middle of the Arab Spring, and they did it peacefully. Um, so now that we're starting uh, to tread in something that's a little bit uh, like maybe uncharted waters for us, you know, now we've got uh, uh, more eyes looking at us. Uh, we're trying to find these new ways to engage in our own social activism. We're almost completely new to this. So I wanted to know how uh, you and, uh, and the indigenous people in uh, North America have organized uh, to increase their own political participation. Uh, has, uh, you know, we, we heard about your education-based training. Uh, has your action brought, uh, has your action been effective in teaching people about your own plight? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've got many tools in our toolkit that we use. Um, you know, my, our organization, uh, you know, has been involved, you know, both here in the U.S., uh, in, in large national coalitions, uh, most notably the Grassroots Global Justice Coalition, uh, whom I strongly suggest you guys get involved with. Um, they, they're called GGJ, and I'd be happy to connect you with them. But GGJ um, and, and, and other coalitions that we're part of, you know, are really essential because of the fact that you never really know 
what kind of opportunities will present themselves uh, when you're working with diverse organizations that are fighting for economic justice, that are fighting for environmental justice, for human rights. Um, and, you know, the GGJ is comprised of about 86 predominantly uh, people of color led organizations, uh, indigenous organizations <coughs> here in the United States um, that are focused on um, everything from immigrant rights to uh, prison justice to, you know, environmental justice to women's rights um, to, you know, indigenous rights. And, you know, we've come together and we developed a campaign platform, a unified campaign platform um, that's called No War, No Global Warming, Build the People's Economy. You know, and we developed it broad so that we could have an opportunity to collaborate and to facilitate convergence uh, because many of our organizations are small, underfunded, uh, you only have a couple staff, but when working with other organizations, there's opportunity for leverage. And I can't stress enough the importance of solidarity. When we look at great systemic change that has come about in contemporary times, such as apartheid in South Africa, the increasing pressure, for example, in Israel and Palestine, you know, the state of Israel is, is under fire, you know, for their craziness and their crazy policy. Um, I think it's important to look at that. Um, and the, you know, huge anti-apartheid campaign right now that's being waged against Israel over Gaza and Palestine. Um, if we look at, you know, the whole campaign to free Leonard Peltier, you know, one of our Native American uh, activists from the American Indian Movement who's been in prison, even though the government knows he's not guilty for killing an FBI agent, they still keep him in prison. You know, but there's a huge uh, multiracial social movement aimed at working on that. And when we look globally at the World Social Forum, uh, you know, there are social forums happening in every region of the planet. We've organized two U.S. social forums now successfully. The first in Atlanta four years ago, and the second during the G20 in 2010 in Detroit. Um, and I guess I just want to go into this to set the context, though. Um, you know, well, working always diligently to facilitate connections with other people, other organizations, other communities whose liberation is tied in with our liberation. We're always looking at strengthening our capacity to respond, not just in a reactionary way, but in an offensive way. And part of that comes down to grassroots training opportunities, understanding our issue, but also being able to convey that in a way that people can understand and grasp easily and develop a curriculum and um, um, using what's called narrative-based storytelling media strategies. Um, a lot of what we do, uh, because we don't have the resources uh, necessarily for big, glitzy media campaigns, is using nonviolent civil disobedience. In other words, training people on how to do direct action, um, uh, but not right to the roadblock, you know. <laughs> there's, there's, there's a lot of miles between zero and 60, okay? And so part of learning direct action is learning the art of escalation and de-escalation, okay? And so a lot of the times, you know, when we go into situations and we do a direct action, whether it's hanging a banner with a critical message off a building or a bridge, or whether it's, you know, locking down a bank that's investing in a dirty project that's violating the human rights of a local community, or whether it's, um, you know, uh, uh, um, interrupting a shareholder meeting of British Petroleum in London uh, and, and, and protesting them in their own home turf. Um, you know, all of these activities are well planned out, well thought out with how we will escalate towards the actual action, but how we will also de-escalate the action and minimize the risk of arrest to our people involved in it. Um, and all of this done within a framework of nonviolence. Now during the Olympics, there was a huge debate between the issue of diversity of tactics and the issue of nonviolence. The, the nonviolent direct action approach. Um, I'm not going to get into that so much with you guys tonight, but there were, there's always going to be folks who, who 
want to go from 0 to 60 like that. But the important thing about how to organize in a social movement framework effectively using nonviolent direct action is understanding how um, um, this whole process is empowered by having an informed political base. You know, so the direct action piece is one element. The other element is, again, the education piece, community organizing piece. You know, developing popular education curriculums, fact sheets, you know, multimedia. Using social media right now is an absolutely essential part of any effective strategy. Twitter, Facebook, you know, all of these things help bring people to support your cause. Also, are elements of communication over great distances with your base. You know, quite often, I get brought into colleges all over the planet just on Skype, you know, right from my living room, just to do a talk just like this, you know, and it's free. And so with limited resources, it's important to be creative about how we approach, you know, strategies. And it's important to understand how to do power analysis. In other words, knowing where to apply your limited resources at a leverage point where you can achieve the greatest movement forward. And you know, these are all things that you need to develop, that you have been developing from where I'm sitting, um, that'll help you. Um, and there's a tremendous amount of resources, especially here in the US. And I'd be happy to make recommendations in terms of training opportunities you know, for communications and campaigns, um, at least in the way that we've been taught. You know? One group that I wanted to recommend in particular is SmartMe. Um, um, you know, and, and they really are the ones who have really developed this whole narrative-based storytelling strategy, which is really about your people speaking for yourselves and lifting up those stories that may not be fact by fact correct, but it's the narrative that your people have in their mind. And there's great power in that. And that's a lot of what we use. We tell our people stories. And it, it moves people, you know, and they cannot be denied, you know. So, um, uh, so I think that I think that you know, I don't I don't know if you have any other questions, but I do want I wanted to see if the group wanted to react or have some questions. Yeah. We'll open it up to questions. Yeah.